Welcome to the great American epic, where we discuss The Walking Dead. Today I will begin with a quotation. Quote, I am sorry this happened to you. This is what Rick says to the first walker he ever encounters, whose pathos is added to by the fact that she cannot walk. The torso has been torn from the legs, so she lies head and body on the grass, only able to reach desperately and crawl. The first time Rick sees this quote-unquote walker, he stumbles, falls, gasps, experiences the grotesque, and rides a bicycle away in shock. It's only later, after he's been educated by Morgan about the new world, that he takes it upon himself to return to this crawler zombie and kill it, shooting it as is necessary to do in the brain. Before he does so, he says, quote, I'm sorry this happened to you. The Rick we meet at the outset of the epic has this tenderness, this intrinsic calling to empathize, which is more spiritual than moral. It won't take long for Rick to take on more epic, heroic dimensions. But at the very beginning, we are won over to Rick by something else, something more primary. Not the fact that he is a leader, but the fact that he is human and has, in a world of zombies, a living soul. Coming out of the hospital where he has survived a pre-fall gunshot wound and survived in a coma during the outbreak of the quote-unquote apocalypse, it is, of course, anything but, our hero is clad, ironically, in a pale light blue hospital gown and a boyish light blue boxer shorts, the latter over which he holds his left hand in a kind of unconscious gesture of propriety or else Adamic shame. Rick is, for reasons unique to himself, one of those types of people whom others, at least a certain kind of other, gravitates to for leadership. Quote, I didn't ask for this at one point, an uncharacteristic point, he will say. But uncharacteristic though that remark is, it's another call upon us to empathize with him. Who deserves to be the one to have to call the shots in a world like this? Rick thrives on being a leader. That's why he's so good at it. But it's a tremendous burden, morally, spiritually, existentially, that not infrequently puts one in double binds and makes one's actions consequential to an extent that exceeds the actions of others much of the time. Season one and especially season two are about contests for leadership, particularly between Rick and his friend slash rival Shane. Shane has nothing or very little of the spiritual sparkle, let's say, of Rick. Morgan, the first man Rick meets upon waking from the coma, is much more akin in sensibility. They will become like long-lost friends, even star-crossed friends, throughout the course of the epic. Rick loses drastically any trace of tenderness by the finale of season five at the latest. And right after he does, by the time it's so clear to everyone, Michonne herself has knocked him out once to try to arrest his hubris. That's one of the points that Morgan reappears in his life. He's been searching for Rick. Morgan, by now, has adopted a lifestyle of eminent peace. He will not kill anyone. It's become his M.O. By contrast, when Morgan sees Rick, Rick has just executed a man point blank. 
His face is covered in blood. He's ruthless. He's even just made a speech. Speeches, note, are a formal feature of epics in which he has said that he's contemplated killing a whole community for being weak and unaware of how bleak the world has become. Rick is, quote, gone in the show's terms. Not too far gone, as another saying goes, but certainly gone. And that's why it's poignant, telling, ironic, when Morgan sees Rick just so, smothered in blood, having just shot a man on his knees. And Morgan says, tenderly, confusedly, uncannily, Rick? As in, Rick, is that you? It does visibly jar Rick for a moment to see Morgan and to hear him, in particular, ask that question. I am not going to trace here Rick's full trajectory from groin-covering, light blue-clad stumbler, sympathizer with people who have turned into zombies, to ruthless, intractable, dominating force of cold-blooded, presumptively clear-eyed will. Sometimes cliches are used like moral compass and losing one's way, not exactly in appropriate terms. However, what I mean to emphasize in this lecture is that one cannot understand the walking dead without understanding the spiritual arc of Rick's story, which culminates eventually in what Morgan calls, quote, a return. What Rick and Herschel earlier in the series called, quote, coming back. Terribly, one time Rick talks about this, about coming back. He says it to a major antagonist, the governor, at a moment at which the governor has none other than Herschel himself on his knees, tied up, captured. Herschel has been consciously a kind of guiding light to Rick spiritually. The governor wants to take over the prison where Rick and our community are trying to make a life. Rick makes an epic speech in which he actually invites the governor and his people to live with them together. By the time Rick says to him, quote, we get to come back, it more enrages than disarms the governor who has told too many lies about Rick to his own people to turn back now. Herschel, tied up there, the governor's sword to his throat, listening to Rick extend hospitality and assert, even to the worst of villains so far, that, quote, everyone gets to come back, causes Herschel to smile. It means, of course, come back to life, to human life, to community, to come back spiritually. The poetic double entendre is clear. The dead get to come back as zombies, but human beings who have become gone or whose humanity has gone missing in this world can come back to life. The governor rejects Rick's offer and abruptly slashes Herschel's throat, a shock to us all. He calls Rick a liar, calls this spiritual truth a lie. Rick screams no, though it's already, in fact, too late. That episode's title is, quote, Too Far Gone. But Herschel dies in peace, is my point, because of witnessing the tack that Rick has taken, the beliefs that Rick in that moment has come to enacted and exuded. Perhaps Herschel in his transcendence is, in an inverse sense, too far gone for this world, too good for it. But for Herschel to be murdered in such a way, directly in the face of such a speech, well, it's those kinds of things that play a role in the fact 
that by the end of season five, Rick is himself seeming like maybe he has become too far gone. But it's not Rick's fate not to come back. Things will get worse before they get better. But he will get, in Morgan's terms, quote, a return. And when he does, it seems transcendent and firm in a way that his character, when he's gone missing, never does. And unless one understands this as Rick's trajectory, one cannot understand the overarching auspices of The Walking Dead. There's no understanding the meaning of the epic, the kind of providence that guides the narrative without seeing this. This particular show, despite how long running it is, is not just a series of one-off anything goes episodes. Like it or not, it has convictions. The Walking Dead has convictions. And these are not meant to be ambiguous, though of course they will not be seen by all or agreed with by all if seen. One conviction, perhaps the primary principle, is the one we have already sketched out some rough terms for from the epic itself. Everyone has, quote, done things. No one, until the point of death, is, quote, too far gone. Quote, we get to come back. Quote, everyone gets a return. This is something more than morality. That's why I call it spiritual, a spiritual vision. Here, I want to follow Rick's story and explain how it eventually leads to the central climactic moment of the epic overall, a spiritual climax. Okay, let's pause here for now and pick up with this later. <laughs> 